Ulysses 15a, the first of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15a. The Mabbot Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram siding set with skeleton tracks, red and green will o' the wisps, and danger signals rows of grimy houses with gaping doors rare lamps with faint rainbow fans round rabiotis halted ice gondola stunted men and women squabble they grab wafers between which are wedged lumps of coral and copper snow sucking they scatter slowly children the swan comb of the gondola high reared forges on through the murk white and blue under a lighthouse whistles call and answer the calls wait my love and i'll be with you the answer round behind the stable a deaf-mute idiot with goggle eyes his shapeless mouth dribbling jerks past shaken in saint vitus dance a chain of children's hands imprisons him the children kithog salute the idiot lifts a palsied left arm and gurgles gahoot the children where's the great light the idiot gobbling gagahest they release him he jerks on a pygmy woman swings on a rope slung between two railings counting a form sprawled against a dustbin and muffled by its arm and hat snores groans grinding growling teeth and snores again on a step a gnome totting among a rubbish tip crouches to shoulder a sack of rags and bones a crone standing by with a smoky oil lamp rams her last bottle in the maw of his sack he heaves his booty tugs askew his peaked cap and hobbles off mutely the crone makes back for her lair swaying her lamp a bandy child a squat on the doorstep with a paper shuttlecock crawls sidling after her in spurts clutches her skirt scrambles up a drunken navvy grips with both hands the railings of an area, lurching heavily. At a corner two night watch in shoulder capes, their hands upon their staff holsters, loom tall. A plate crashes, a woman screams, a child wails. Oaths of a man roar, mutter, cease. Figures wander, lurk, peer from warrens. In a room lit by a candle, stuck in a bottleneck, a slut combs out the tats from the hair of a scruffless child. Sissy Caffrey's voice, still young, sings shrill from a lane. Sissy Caffrey. I gave it to Molly because she was jolly. The leg of the duck, the leg of the duck. Private Carr and Private Compton swagger sticks tight in their oxters as they march unsteadily right about face and burst together from their mouths a volleyed fart laughter of men from the lane a horse virago retorts the virago signs on you hairy arse more power the cabin girl sissy caffrey more luck to me cabin coothill and bell turbot she sings i gave it to nelly to stick in her belly the leg of the duck a leg of the duck private car and private compton turn and counter retort their tunics bright right in a lamp glow black sockets of caps on their blond cropped poles stephen dedalus and lynch pass through the crowd close to the redcoats private compton jerks his finger way for the parson private car turns and calls what ho parson sissy caffrey her voice soaring higher she has it she got it wherever she put it the leg of the duck stephen flourishing the ash plant on his left hand chants with joy the introit for paschal time lynch his jockey cap low on his brow attends him a sneer of discontent wrinkling his face stephen vidi aquam egredientem de templo a la terra dextro alleluia the famished snaggletusks of an elderly bawd protrude from a doorway the bawd her voice whispering huskily Shh, come here till i tell you 
Maidenhead inside. St Stephen. Altius aliquantulum. Et omnes ad quos pervenit aqua ista. The bawd spits in their trail her jet of venom. Trinity medicals. Fallopian tube. All prick and no pence. Edie Boardman, sniffling, crouched with Bertha Supple, draws her shawl across her nostrils. Edie Boardman, bickering. And says the one I seen you up faithful place with your square pusher, the greaser off the railway, in his come to bed hat. Did you? says I. That's not for you to say, says I. You never seen me in the man trap with the married Highlander, says I. The likes of her. Stag that one is, stubborn as a mule, and her walking with two fellows the one time. Kilbride, the engine driver, and Lance Corporal, Oliphant. Stephen, triumphal eater. Salvi facti sunt. He flourishes his ash plant, shivering the lamp image, shattering light over the world. A liver and white spaniel on the prowl slinks after him, growling. Lynch scares it with a kick. Lynch. So that? Stephen looks behind. So that gesture, not music, not odor, would be a universal language, the gift of tongues, rendering visible not the lay sense, but the first entelechy. The structural rhythm. Lynch. Pornosophical philotheology. Metaphysics in Mecklenburg Street. Stephen. We have shrew-ridden Shakespeare and henpecked Socrates. Even the all-wisest Stagrite was bitted, bridled, and mounted by a light of love. Lynch. Bah. Stephen. Anyway, who wants two gestures to illustrate a loaf and a jug? This movement illustrates the loaf and jug of bread or wine in Omar. Hold my stick. Lynch. Damn your yellow stick. Where are you going? Stephen. Lecherous links to la belle dame sans merci, Georgina Johnson. Ad deum qui laetificat inventuta meum. Stephen thrusts the ash plant on him and slowly holds out his hands his head going back, till both hands are a span from his breast, downturned, in planes intersecting, the fingers about to part, the left being higher. Lynch. Which is the jug of bread? It skills not. That or the custom-house. Illustrate thou. Here, take your crutch and walk. They pass. Tommy Caffrey scrambles to a gas-lamp and clasping climbs in spasms. From the top spur he slides down. Jacky Caffrey clasps to climb. The navvy lurches against the lamp. The twins scuttle off in the dark. The navvy, swaying, presses a forefinger against a wing of his nose and ejects from the farther nostril a long liquid jet of snot. Shouldering the lamp, he staggers away through the crowd with his flaring cresset. Snakes of river fog creep slowly from drains, clefts, cesspools, mid middens, arise on all sides stagnant fumes. A glow leaps in the south beyond the seaward reaches of the river. The navvy, staggering forward, cleaves the crowd and lurches toward the tram siding. On the further side, under the railway bridge, Bloom appears, flushed, panting, cramming bread and chocolate into a side pocket. From Gillen's hairdresser's window, a composite portrait shows him gallant Nelson's image. A concave mirror at the side presents to him lovelorn, long-lost, lugubru, buluhum. Grave Gladstone sees him level, bloom for bloom. He passes, struck by the stare of truculent Wellington. But in the convex mirror grin, unstuck, the Bonham eyes and fat chuck cheek chops of jolly poldy, the ricksticks doldy. At Antonio Rabiotti's door, bloom halts. Sweated under the bright arc lamp. He disappears. In a moment he reappears and hurries on. Bloom. Fish and tatters. And g Ah. He disappears into Olhausen's, the pork butcher's, under the downcoming roll shutter. A few moments later he emerges from under the shutter, puffing poldy, blowing bluehoom. In each hand he holds a parcel, one containing a lukewarm pig's crubine, the other a cold sheep's trotter, sprinkled with whole pepper. He gasps, standing upright, then bending to one side he presses a parcel against his ribs and groans. 
bloom. Stitch in my side. Why did I run? He takes breath with care and goes forward slowly towards the lamp-set siding. The glow leaps again. Bloom. What is that? A flasher? Searchlight. He stands at Cormac's corner, watching. Bloom. Aurora Borealis or a steel foundry? Ah, the brigade, of course. South side, anyhow. Big blaze. Might be his house. Beggar's bush. We're safe. He hums cheerfully. London's burning, London's burning, on fire, on fire. He catches sight of the navvy lurching through the crowd at the farther side of Talbot Street. I'll miss him. Run, quick, better cross here. He darts to cross the road. Urchins shout. The urchins. Mind out, mister! Two cyclists with lighted paper lanterns a-swing swim by him, grazing him, their bells rattling. The bells. Halt, yalt, yalt, yalt. Bloom halts erect, stung by a spasm. Ow! He looks round, darts forward suddenly. Through the rising fog a dragon sand strewer, travelling at caution, slews heavily down upon him, its huge red headlight winking, its trolley hissing on the wire. The motorman bangs his foot gong. The gong. Bang, bang, blob, back, blood, bug, blue. The brake cracks violently. Bloom, raising a policeman's white-gloved hand, blunders, stiff-legged, out of the track. The motorman, thrown forward, pug-nosed on the guide-wheel, yells as he slides past over chains and keys. The motorman. Hey, shit-breeches! Are you doing the hat trick? Bloom trick leaps to the curbstone and halts again. He brushes a mud flake from his cheek with a parceled hand. Bloom. No thoroughfare. Close shave, that, but cured the stitch. Must take up Sandow's exercises again. On the hands down. Insure against street accident, too. The providential. He feels his trouser pocket. Poor Mama's panacea. Heel easily catch in track, or bootlace in a cog. Day the wheel of the black Mariah peeled off my shoe at Leonard's corner. Third time is the charm. Shoe trick. Insolent driver. I ought to report him. Tension makes them nervous. Might be the fellow balked me this morning with that horsey woman. Same style of beauty. Quick of him all the same. The stiff walk. True words spoken in jest. That awful cramp in Lad Lane. Something poisonous I ate. Emblem of luck. Why? Probably lost cattle. Mark of the beast. He closes his eyes an instant. Bit light in the head. Monthly or effect of the other. Brain fog fag. That tired feeling. Too much for me now. Ow! A sinister figure leans on plated legs against O'Byrne's wall. A visage unknown, injected with dark mercury. From under a wide-leaved sombrero, the figure regards him with evil eye. Bloom. Buenas noches, señorita Blanca. ¿Qué calle es esta? The figure, impassive, raises a signal arm. Password. Sreid Mabot. Bloom. Ha <laughs> ha. Merci. Esperanto. Slan leaf. He mutters, Gaelic League spy sent by that fire-eater. He steps forward. A sack-shouldered ragman bars his path. He steps left, ragsack man left. Bloom. I beg. He swerves, sidles, step aside, slips past and on. Bloom. Keep to the right, right, right. If there is a signpost planted by the touring club at Step Aside, who procured that public boon? I, who lost my way and contributed to the columns of the Irish cyclist, the letter headed, In Darkest Step Aside. Keep, keep, keep to the right. Rags and bones at midnight. A fence, more likely. First place murderer makes for. Wash off his sins of the world. Jackie Caffrey, hunted by Tommy Caffrey, runs full tilt against Bloom. Bloom. Oh! Socked on weak hams, he halts. Tommy and Jackie vanish there, there. 
Bloom pats with parceled hands. Watch fob. Pocketbook pocket. Purse poke. Sweets of sin. Potato soap. Bloom. Beware of pickpockets. Old thieves dodge. Collide. Then snatch your purse. The retriever approaches, sniffing nose to the ground. A sprawled form sneezes. A stooped bearded figure appears, garbed in the long caftan of an elder in Zion, and a smoking cap with magenta tassels. Horned spectacles hang down at the wings of the nose. Yellow poison streaks are on the drawn face. Rudolph. Second half crown waste money today. I told you not to go with drunken goy ever. So you catch no money. Bloom hides the crubeen and trotter behind his back and, crestfallen, feels warm and cold feet meat. Ja, ich weiß, Papachi. Rudolph. What are you making down this place? Have you no soul? With feeble vulture talons he feels the silent face of Bloom. Are you not my son Leopold, the grandson of Leopold? Are you not my dear son Leopold, who left the house of his father and left the gods of his father Abraham and Jacob? Bloom, with precaution. I suppose so, father. Mosenthal, all that's left of him. Rudolph, severely. One night they bring you home drunk as dog after you spend your good money. What do you call them, running chaps? Bloom, in youth's smart blue Oxford suit with white vest slips, narrow-shouldered in brown alpine hat, wearing gent's sterling silver Waterbury keyless watch and double curb Albert with seal attached, one side of him coated with stiffening mud. Harriers, father, only that once. Rudolph, once. Mud, head to foot, cut your hand open, lock jaw. They make you kaput, Leopold Laden. You watch them chaps. Bloom weakly. They challenged me to a sprint. It was muddy. I slipped. Rudolph, with contempt. Goyim naches. Nice spectacles for your poor mother. Bloom. Mama. Ellen Bloom. In pantomime dame's stringed mobcap. Widow Twanky's crinoline and bustle. Blouse with mutton-leg sleeves buttoned behind. Grey mittens and cameo brooch. Her plaited hair in a crispine net appears over the staircase banisters, a slanted candlestick in her hand, and cries out in shrill alarm, Oh, blessed Redeemer, what have they done to him? My smelling salts! She hauls up a reef of skirt and ransacks the pouch of her striped blay petticoat. A file, an angus dye, a shriveled potato, and a celluloid doll fall out. Sacred heart of Mary, where were you at all at all? Bloom, mumbling, his eyes downcast, begins to bestow his parcels in his filled pockets, but desists, muttering. A voice, sharply. Poldy. Bloom. Who? He ducks and wards off a blow, clumsily. At your service. He looks up. Beside her mirage of date palms, a handsome woman in Turkish costume stands before him. Opulent curves fill out her scarlet trousers and jacket slashed with gold. A wide yellow cummerbund girdles her. A white yashmak, violet in the night, covers her face, leaving free only her large, dark eyes and raven hair. Bloom. Molly. Marion. Welly, Mrs. Marion, from this out, my dear man, when you speak to me. Satirically. As poor little hobby, cold feet, waiting so long. Bloom shifts from foot to foot. No, no, not the least little bit. He breathes in deep agitation, swallowing gulps of air, questions, hopes, crew beans for her supper, things to tell her, excuse, desire, spellbound. A coin gleams on her forehead. On her feet are jeweled toe-rings. Her ankles are linked by slender fetter-chain. Beside her a camel, hooded with a turreting turban, waits. A silk ladder of innumerable rungs climbs to his bobbing howdah. He ambles near with disgruntled hindquarters. Fiercely she slaps his haunch. Her gold curb wrist bangles angling, scolding him in Moorish. Marion. Nebrakada. Femininum. The camel, lifting a foreleg, plucks from a tree a large mango fruit, offers it to his mistress, blinking, 
in his cloven hoof, then droops his head and grunting, with uplifted neck, fumbles to kneel. Bloom stoops his back for leapfrog. Bloom. I can give you, I mean, as your business manager, Mrs. Marion, if you... Marion. So you notice some change? Her hand passing slowly over her trinketed stomacher, a slow, friendly mockery in her eyes. Oh, Poldy, Poldy, you are a poor old stick in the mud. Go and see life, see the wide world. Bloom. I was just going back for that lotion, white wax, orange flower water. Shop closes early on Thursday, but the first thing in the morning... He pats divers' pockets. This moving kidney. Ah! He points to the south, then to the east. A cake of new clean lemon soap arises, diffusing light and perfume. The soap. We are a capital couple, our bloom and I. He brightens the earth, I polish the sky. The freckled face of Sweeney, the druggist, appears in the disc of the soap sun. Sweeney. Three and a penny, please. Bloom. Yes, for my wife, Mrs. Marion's special recipe. Marion softly. Poldy. Bloom. Yes, ma'am. Marion. Ti tremo un poco il cuore. In disdain she saunters away, humming the duet from Don Giovanni, plump as a pampered pouter pigeon. Bloom. Are you sure about that voglio? I mean, the pronunciation? He follows, followed by the sniffing terrier. The elderly bod seizes his sleeve, the bristles of her chin-mole glittering. The bod. Ten shillings a maiden head, fresh thing was never touched. Fifteen. There's no one in it, only her old father that's dead drunk. She points. In the gap of her dark den, furtive, rain-bedraggled Bridey Kelly stands. Bridey. Hatch Street. Any good in your mind? With a squeak, she flaps her bat-shawl and runs. A burly rough pursues with booted strides. He stumbles on the steps, recovers, plunges into gloom. Weak squeaks of laughter are heard, weaker. The bod, her wolf-eyes shining. He's getting his pleasure. You won't get a virgin in the flash-houses. Ten shillings. Don't be all night before the police in plain clothes sees us. Sixty-seven is a bitch. Leering, Gertie McDowell limps forward. She draws from behind, ogling, and shows coyly her bloodied clout. Gertie. With all my worldly goods, I, thee, and thou. She murmurs. You did that. I hate you. Bloom. I? When? You are dreaming. I never saw you. The bod. Leave the gentleman alone, you cheat. Writing the gentleman false letters. Street walking and soliciting. Better for your mother take the strap to you at the bedpost, hussy like you. Gertie, to Bloom. When you saw the secrets of my bottom drawer, she paused, his sleeve slobbering. Dirty married man, I love you for doing that to me. She glides away crookedly. Mrs. Breen, in man's frieze overcoat with loose bellows pockets, stands in the causeway, her roguish eyes wide open, smiling in all her herbivorous buck teeth. Mrs. Breen. Mr. Bloom coughs gravely. <clears throat> Madam, when we last had this pleasure by letter, dating the sixteenth instant. Mrs. Breen. Mr. Bloom, you down here in the haunts of sin, I caught you nicely. Scamp. Bloom, hurriedly. Not so loud, my name. Whatever do you think of me? Don't give me away. Walls have ears. How do you do? It's ages since I... You're looking splendid. Absolutely it. Seasonable weather we're having this time of year. Black refracts heat. Shortcut home here. Interesting quarter. Rescue of fallen women. Magdalen Asylum. I am the secretary. Mrs. Breen holds up a finger. Now, don't tell a big fib. I know somebody won't like that. Oh, just wait till I see Molly. Slyly. Account for yourself this very minute, or woe betide you. Bloom looks behind. She often said she'd like to visit. Slumming. The exotic, you see. Negro servants in livery, too, if she had money. Othello, black brute. Eugene Stratton. Even the bones and corner man at the Livermore Christie's. Bohe brothers. Sweep, for that matter. Tom and Sam Bohe, 
colored coons in white duck suits scarlet socks upstarched sambo chokers and large scarlet asters in their buttonholes leap out each has a banjo slung their pale or smaller negroid hands jingle the twing twang wires flashing white kaffir eyes and tusks they rattle through the breakdown in clumsy clogs twinging singing back to back toe heel heel with smack fat clacking nigger lips tom and sam there's someone in the house with dinah there's someone in the house i know there's someone in the house with dinah playing on the old banjo they whisk black masks from raw babby faces then chuckling chortling trumming twanging they diddle diddle cakewalk dance away bloom with a sour tenderish smile a little shrivel shall we if you are so inclined would you like me perhaps to embrace you just for a fraction of a second mrs breen screams gaily oh you ruck you ought to see yourself bloom for old sake's sake i only meant a square party a mixed marriage mingling of our different little conjugals you know i had a soft corner for you gloomily twas i sent you that valentine of the dear gazelle mrs breen glory alice you do look a holy show killing simply she puts out her hand inquisitively what are you hiding behind your back tell us there's a dear bloom seizes her wrist with his free hand josie powell that was prettiest deb in dublin how time flies by do you remember harking back in retrospective arrangement old christmas night georgina simpson's housewarming while they were playing the irving bishop game finding the pin blindfold and thought reading subject what is in this snuff-box mrs breen you were the lion of the night with your serio-comic recitation and you looked the part you were always a favorite with the ladies bloom squire of dames in dinner jacket with watered silk facings blue masonic badge in his buttonhole black bow and mother-of-pearl studs a prismatic champagne glass tilted in his hand ladies and gentlemen i give you ireland home and beauty mrs breen the dear dead days beyond recall love's old sweet song bloom meaningfully dropping his voice i confess i'm teapot with curiosity to find out whether some person's something is a little teapot at present mrs breen gushingly tremendously teapot london's teapot and i'm simply teapot all over me she rubs sides with him after the parlour mystery games and the crackers from the tree we sat on the staircase ottoman under the mistletoe to his company bloom wearing a purple napoleon hat with an amber half-moon his fingers and thumb passing slowly down to her soft moist meaty palm which she surrenders gently the witching hour of night i took the splinter out of this hand carefully slowly tenderly he slips on her finger a ruby ring la siderem la mano mrs breen in a one-piece evening frock executed in moonlight blue a tinsel sylph's diadem on her brow and her dance card fallen beside her moon-blue satin slippers curves her palm softly breathing quickly voglio e no you're hot you're scalding the left hand nearest the heart bloom when you made your present choice they said it was beauty and the beast i can never forgive you that his clenched fist at his brow think what it means all you meant to me then hoarsely woman it's breaking me dennis breen white tall hatted with wisdom healy's sandwich boards shuffles past them in carpet slippers his dull beard thrust out muttering to right and left little alf bergen cloaked in the pall of the ace of spades dogs him to left and right doubled in laughter alf bergen points jeeringly at the sandwich boards you peep up mrs breen to bloom high jinks below stairs she gives him the glad eye why didn't you kiss the spot to make it well you wanted to 
Bloom, shocked. Molly's best friend, could you? Mrs. Breen, her pulpy tongue between her lips, offers a pigeon kiss. Hmm. <laughs> the answer is a lemon. Have you a little present for me there? Bloom, offhandedly. Kosher, a snack for supper. The home without potted meat is incomplete. I was at Leah, Mrs. Bandman Palmer, trenchant exponent of Shakespeare. Unfortunately, threw away the programme. Rattling good place round there for pig's feet. Feel. Richie Goulding, three ladies' hats pinned on his head, appears weighted to one side by the black legal bag of Collins and Ward, on which a skull and crossbones are painted in white lime wash. He opens it and shows it full of polonies, kippered herrings, Finden haddies, and tight packed pills. Richie. Best value in dub. Bald Pat, bothered beetle, stands on the curbstone folding his napkin, waiting to wait. Pat. Advances with a tilted dish of spill spilling gravy. Steak and kidney, bottle of lager. He he he. Wait till I wait. Richie. Good God, I never rate, you know. With hanging head he marches doggedly forward. The navvy lurching by gores him with his flaming pronghorn. Richie, with a cry of pain, his hand to his back. Ah, brights, lights. Bloom points to the navvy. A spy. Don't attract attention. I hate stupid crowds. I am not on pleasure bent. I am in a grave predicament. Mrs. Breen. Humbugging and delothering, as per usual with your cock-and-bull story. Bloom. I want to tell you a little secret about how I came to be here, but you must never tell, not even Molly. I have a most particular reason. Mrs. Breen, all agog. Oh, not for worlds. Bloom. Uh, let's walk on, shall us? Mrs. Breen. Let's. The bod makes an unheeded sign. Bloom walks on with Mrs. Breen. The terrier follows, whining piteously, wagging his tail. The bod. Jewman's melt. Bloom, in an oatmeal sporting suit, a sprig of woodbine in the lapel, tony buff shirt, shepherd's plaid St. Andrew's cross scarf tie, white spats, fawn dust coat on his arm, tawny red brogues, field glasses in bandolier, and a grey billycock hat. Do you remember a long, long time, years and years ago, just after Millie, marionette we called her, was weaned when we all went together to fairy house races, was it? Mrs. Breen, in smart sacks, tailor-made, white velours hat and spider veil. Leopard's Town. Bloom. I mean Leopard's Town, and Molly won seven shillings on a three-year-old named Nevertell. And coming home, along by Fox Rock, in that old five-seater Chandradan of a wagonette, you were in your heyday then, and you had on that new hat of white velours with a surround of mole fur that Mrs. Hayes advised you to buy because it was marked down to nineteen and eleven, a bit of wire and an old rag of velveteen, and I'll lay you what you like. She did it on purpose. Mrs. Breen. She did, of course. The cat, don't tell me. Nice advisor. Bloom because it didn't suit you one quarter as well as the other ducky little tammy tongue with the bird of paradise wing in it that i admired on you and you honestly looked just too fetching in it though it was a pity to kill it you cruel naughty creature little mite of a thing with a heart the size of a full stop mrs breen squeezes his arm simpers naughty cruel i was bloom low secretly ever more rapidly and Molly was eating a sandwich of spiced beef out of Mrs. Joe Gallagher's lunch basket. Frankly, though she had her advisers or admirers, I never cared much for her style. She was Mrs. Breen. Too. Bloom. Yes, and Molly was laughing because Rogers and Maggot O'Reilly were mimicking a cock as we passed a farmhouse, and Marcus Tertius Moses, the tea merchant, drove past us in a gig with his daughter, Dancer Moses was her name, and the poodle in her lap bridled up, and you asked me if I ever heard or read or knew or came across... Mrs. Breen eagerly, yes, 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 yes. She fades from his side. Followed by the whining dog, he walks on towards Hell's Gate. In an archway, a standing woman bent forward, her feet apart, pisses, cowily. Outside a shuttered pub, a bunch of loiterers listen to a tale which their broken-snouted gaffer rasps out with raucous humor. 
an armless pair of them flop wrestling growling in maimed sodden playfight the gaffer crouches his voice twisted in his snout and when cairns came down from the scaffolding in beaver street what was he after doing it unto only into the bucket of porter that was there waiting on the shavings for derwin's plasterers the loiterers guffaw with cleft pallets oh jays their paint-speckled hats wag spattered with the size and lime of their lodges they frisk limblessly about him bloom coincidence too they think it funny anything but that broad daylight trying to walk lucky no woman the loiterers jays that's a good one glauber salts oh jays into the men's porter bloom passes cheap whores singly coupled shawled dishevelled call from lanes doors corners the whores are you going far queer fellow how's your middle leg got a match on you hey come here till i stiffen it for you he plodges through their sump toward the lighted street beyond from a bulge of window curtains a gramophone rears a battered brazen trunk in the shadow a shebeen keeper haggles with the navvy and the two redcoats the navvy belching where's the bloody house the shebeen keeper Purden Street, shilling a bottle of stout, respectable woman. The navvy, gripping the two red coats, staggers forward with them. Come on, you, you British army. Private car behind his back. He ain't half balmy. Private Compton laughs. What ho? Private car to the navvy. Portobello barracks canteen. You ask for car, just car. The navvy shouts. We are the boys of Wexford. Private Compton. Say, what price the sergeant major? Private Carr. Bennett, he's my pal. I love old Bennett. The navvy shouts. The galling chain and free our native land. He staggers forward, dragging them with him. Bloom stops at fault. The dog approaches, his tongue out lolling, panting. Bloom. Wild goose chase this. Disorderly houses lord knows where they are gone drunks cover distance double quick nice mix-up seen at westland row then jump in first class with third ticket then too far train with engine behind might have taken me to malahide or a siding for the night or a collision second drink does it once is a dose what am i following him for still if I hadn't heard about Mrs. Beaufoy Purifoy, I wouldn't have gone and wouldn't have met Kismet. He'll lose that cash. Relieving office here. Good biz for cheap jacks, organs. What do you lack? Soon got, soon gone. Might have lost my life, too, with that mangong wheel-track trolley glare juggernaut. Only for presence of mind. Can't always save you, though. If I had passed Trulock's window that day two minutes later would have been shot absence of body still if bullet only went through my coat get damages for shock five hundred pounds what was he kildare street club toff god help his gamekeeper he gazes ahead reading on the wall a scrawled chalk legend wet dream and a phallic design odd molly drawing on the frosted carriage pane at kingstown what's that like gaudy doll women loll in the lighted doorways in window embrasures smoking bird's eye cigarettes the odour of the sick sweet weed floats towards him in slow round ovaling reeds the reeds sweet are the sweets sweets of sin bloom my spine's a bit limp go or turn and this food eat it and get all pig-sticky absurd i am waste of money one and eight pence too much the retriever drives a cold snivelling muzzle against his hand wagging his tail strange how they take to me even that brute to-day better speak to him first like they like rencontre stinks like a polecat chacun son gout he might be mad dog days uncertain in his movements good fellow fido good fellow gary owen 
The wolf-dog sprawls on his back, wriggling obscenely with begging paws, his long black tongue lolling out. Influence of his surroundings. Uh, give and have done with it, provided nobody. Calling encouraging words, he shambles back with a furtive poacher's tread, dogged by the setter, into a dark, stale-stunk corner. He unrolls one parcel and goes to dump the crubeen softly, but holds back and feels the trotter. Sizable for threepence. But then I have it in my left hand. Calls for more effort. Why? Smaller from want of use. Oh, let it slide. Two and six. With regret, he lets the unrolled crubeen and trotter slide. The mastiff mauls the bundle clumsily and gluts himself with growling greed, crunching the bones. Two rain-caped watch approach, silent, vigilant. They murmur together, the watch. Bloom, of bloom, for bloom, bloom. Each lays hand on Bloom's shoulder. First watch. Caught in the act. Commit no nuisance. Bloom stammers. I, I am doing good to others. A covey of gulls, storm petrels, rises hungrily from liffy slime with banbury cakes in their beaks. The gulls. Caw, cave, cankery, cake. Bloom. The friend of man, trained by kindness. He points. Bob Duran, toppling from a high bar stool, sways over the munching spaniel. Bob Duran. Tell, sir, give us the paw. Give the paw. The bulldog growls, his scruff standing, a goblet of pig's knuckle between his molars, through which rabid scumspittle dribbles. Bob Duran falls silently into an area. Second watch. Prevention of cruelty to animals. Bloom enthusiastically. A noble work! I scolded the tram-driver on Harold's Cross Bridge for elusing the poor horse with his harness scab. Bad French I got for my pains. Of course it was frosty in the last tram. All tales of circus life are highly demoralizing. Signor Maffei, passion-pale, in lion-tamer's costume with diamond studs in his shirt-front, steps forward holding a circus paper-hoop a curling carriage-whip, and a revolver with which he covers the gorging boarhound. Signor Maffei, with a sinister smile. Ladies and gentlemen, my educated greyhound, it was I broke in the bucking bronco Ajax with my patent spiked saddle for carnivores, lash under the belly with a knotted thong, block, tackle, and a strangling pulley will bring your lion to heel, no matter how fractured. Even Leo Ferox there, the Libyan man-eater. A red-hot crowbar and some niniment rubbing on the burning part produced Fritz of Amsterdam, the thinking hyena. He glares. I possess the Indian sign. The glint of my eye does it with these breast sparklers. With a bewitching smile. I now introduce Mademoiselle Ruby, the pride of the ring. First watch. Come, name and address. Bloom. I have forgotten for the moment. Ah, oh, yes. He takes off his high-grade hat, saluting. Dr. Bloom, Leopold, dental surgeon. You have heard of von Bloom Pasha? Umpteen millions. Donner Wetter owns half Austria, Egypt. Cousin. First watch. Proof. A card falls from inside the leather headband of Bloom's hat. Bloom. In red fez, Cadi's dress coat, with broad green sash, wearing a false badge of the Legion of Honor, picks up the card hastily and offers it. Allow me. My club is the Junior Army and Navy. Solicitors, Messieurs. John Henry Menton, 27 Bachelor's Walk. First watch. Reads. Henry Flower, no fixed abode, unlawfully watching and besetting. Second watch. An alibi, you are cautioned. Bloom produces from his heart pocket a crumpled yellow flower. This is the flower in question. It was given me by a man I don't know his name. Plausibly. You know that old joke, Rose of Castile? Bloom. <laughs> the change of name? Virag. He murmurs privately and confidentially. We are engaged, you see, Sergeant. Lady in the case, love entanglement. He shoulders the second watch gently. 
dash it all it's a way we gallants have in the navy uniform that does it he turns gravely to the first watch still of course you do get your waterloo sometimes drop in some evening and have a glass of old burgundy to the second watch gaily i'll introduce you inspector she's game do it in the shake of a lamb's tail a dark mercurialized face appears leading a veiled figure the dark mercury the castle is looking for him he was drummed out of the army martha thick veiled a crimson halter round her neck a copy of the irish times in her hand in tone of reproach pointing henry leopold lionel thou lost one clear my name first watch sternly come to the station bloom scared hats himself steps back then plucking at his heart and lifting his right forearm on the square he gives the sign and dugard of fellowcraft no no worshipful master light of love mistaken identity the lion's mail le surx and du bosc you remember the child's fratricide case we medical men by striking him dead with a hatchet i am wrongfully accused better one guilty escape than ninety-nine wrongfully condemned Martha, sobbing behind her veil. Breach of promise. My real name is Peggy Griffin. He wrote to me that he was miserable. I'll tell my brother. The bective rug a full back on you. Heartless flirt. Bloom behind his hand. She's drunk. The woman is inebriated. He murmurs vaguely the pass of Ephraim. Shit belief. Second watch, tears in his eyes to Bloom you ought to be thoroughly well ashamed of yourself bloom gentlemen of the jury let me explain a pure mare's nest i'm a man misunderstood i am being made a scapegoat of i am a respectable married man without a stain on my character i live in eccles street my wife and i the daughter of a most distinguished commander a gallant upstanding gentleman what do you call him major general brian tweedy one of britain's fighting men who helped to win our battles got his majority for the heroic defence of rourke's drift first watch regiment bloom turns to the gallery the royal dublins boys the salt of the earth known the world over i think i see some old comrades in arms up there among you the r d f with your own metropolitan police guardians of our homes the pluckiest lads and the finest body of men as physique in the service of our sovereign a voice turn coat up the boars who booed joe chamberlain bloom his hand on the shoulder of the first watch my old dad too was a j p i'm as staunch a britisher as you are sir i fought with the colours for king and country in the absent-minded war under general go in the park and was disabled at spy and cop and blow em fontaine was mentioned in dispatches i did all a white man could with quiet feeling jim bloodso hold her nozzle against the bank first watch profession or trade bloom well i follow a literary occupation author journalist in fact we are just bringing out a collection of prize stories of which i am the inventor something that is an entirely new departure i am connected with the british and irish press if you ring up miles crawford strides out jerkily a quill between his teeth his scarlet beak blazes with the aureole of his straw hat he dangles a hank of spanish onions in one hand and holds with the other hand a telephone receiver nozzle to his ear. Miles Crawford. His cock swattles wagging. Hello, 7784. Hello. Free men's urinal and weekly r swipe here. Paralyze Europe. You which? Blue bags. Who writes? Is it Bloom? Mr. Philip Bufoy, pale-faced, stands in the witness box in accurate morning dress, outburst pocket with peak of handkerchief showing, creased lavender trousers and patent boots. He carries a large portfolio labelled Matcham's Masterstrokes. Bufoy drawls. No, you aren't. Not by a long shot, if I know it. I don't see it, that's all. No born gentleman, no one with the most rudimentary promptings of a gentleman, would stoop to such particularly loathsome conduct. One of those, my lord. 
a plagiarist, a soapy sneak masquerading as a literature. It's perfectly obvious that with the most inherent baseness he has cribbed some of my best-selling copy, really gorgeous stuff, a perfect gem, the love passages in which are beneath suspicion, the Beaufoy books of love and great possessions, with which your lordship is doubtless familiar, are a household word throughout the kingdom. Bloom murmurs with hangdog meekness glum. That bit about the laughing witch hand in hand I take exception to, if I may. Beaufoy, his lip uncurled, smiles superciliously on the court. You funny ass, you. You're too beastly awful weird for words. I don't think you need over-excessively disincommodate yourself in that regard. My literary agent, Mr. J. B. Pinker, is in attendance. I presume, my lord, we shall receive the usual witnesses' fees, shan't we? You are considerably out of pocket over this bally pressman Johnny, this Jack Dot Rhymes, who has not even been to a university. Bloom indistinctly. University of life, bad art. Beaufoy shouts, It's a damnably foul lie, showing the moral rottenness of the man. He extends his portfolio. We have here damning evidence, the corpus delicti, my lord, a specimen of my maturer work disfigured by the hallmark of the beast. A voice from the gallery. Moses, Moses, king of the Jews, wiped his arse in the daily news. Bloom bravely. Overdrawn. Beaufoy. You low cad, you ought to be ducked in the horse-pond, you rotter. To the court. Why, look at the man's private life, leading a quadruple existence, street angel and house devil not fit to be mentioned in mixed society the arch conspirator of the age bloom to the court and he a bachelor how first watch the king versus bloom call the woman driscoll the crier mary driscoll scullery maid mary driscoll a slipshod servant girl approaches she has a bucket on the crook of her arm and a scouring brush in her hand second watch another are you of the unfortunate class mary driscoll indignantly i'm not a bad one i bear a respectable character and was four months in my last place i was in a situation six pounds a year and my chances with fridays out and i had to leave owing to his carryings on first watch what do you tax him with mary driscoll he made a certain suggestion, but I thought more of myself, poor as I am. Bloom, in house jacket of ripple cloth, flannel trousers, heelless slippers, unshaven, his hair rumpled, softly. I treated you white. I gave you mementos, smart emerald garters, far above your station. Incautiously, I took your part when you were accused of pilfering. There's a medium in all things. Play cricket. Mary Driscoll excitedly. As God is looking down on me this night, if ever I laid a hand to them oilsters. First watch. The offence complained of? Did something happen? Mary Driscoll. He surprised me in the rear of the premises, Your Honour, when the missus was out shopping one morning with a request for a safety pin. He held me, and I was discoloured in four places as a result, and he interfered twice with my clothing. Bloom. She counter-assaulted. Mary Driscoll scornfully. I had more respect for the scouring brush, so I had. I remonstrated him, your lord, and he remarked, Keep it quiet. General laughter. End of Ulysses 15a Recorded by Anita Roy Dobbs, San Francisco, June 2006